Hello, this is to say with Kentucky Rose Devotionals, and we're searching out for the roses in the Word of God, and we have just finished up James, so I thought it would be good to just follow up with the other half-brother of Jesus, Jude. So we're going to go to the book of Jude. We are probably not going to finish it today, even though it is just one chapter, um, the whole book of Jude, but uh, we're going to kind of take it in sections if we need to, because there is a lot in the book of Jude. And so the book of Jude, of course, is is authored by uh, the other half-brother of Jesus, which um, he was the brother of James, obviously. So just we just got through hearing words from James, and now we're going to hear from the other half-brother of Jesus. He does not identify himself just as um, James did not identify himself as the brother of Jesus. Um, he identifies himself in two ways. He identifies himself as the brother of James, and he identifies himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. So that lets us know a lot about um, Jude. Same humility, um, same situation of him not believing Jesus was the Son of God until after the crucifixion. When the crucifixion and the resurrection took place, Jude and James both became believers of their brother Jesus. So um, it changed their lives and, and made humble men out of them. Men that were willing to receive and accept um, the message of Jesus Christ. And, and that's what happens when you come into contact with Jesus and you realize what he did for you. You, you feel that spirit, that presence that draws you to him, um, that changes your life forever. You are never the same. And so the blood of the cross had saved him, and that's what he was focusing on. He wasn't focusing on his his earthly relationship with, as a brother, but he was focusing on that heavenly relationship that he had found his Messiah. And um, and that was more important than family blood. More important than anything is, is knowing that he was saved through the power of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for him and so many others for the world. So um, he was writing this letter just as James was was writing his letter to the church, so was Jude. Jude was writing his letter to, to the Christians. He wanted to deal with some certain topics that were not easy ones to deal with. And really, he was letting them know this wasn't necessarily something he wanted to write, but he did it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because these were things that were needed to be told to the church, even if they don't want to hear it. And there's lots of things today that is not wanted um, by the church of today. People want you to just give them the feel-good message is just to give them the just the love parts of the Bible. They don't want to take the whole word of God. And this is what Jude is talking about. He's talking about the dangers of not declaring the whole word of God and not letting the whole word of God penetrate into your heart and in your life. And so there were three things he did here um, in this message that was so necessary for us to hear. Three ways that Jude was identifying um, with his Christian readers. He wanted the people who were reading this letter to identify these things. He wanted them to know that, that Christians were called, that we're called by God and only God can call us. Only he can deliver us. And we simply have to answer when he calls us. Whatever it is that he's calling us to do. When he calls, we answer. So we're the called as the church. He wanted us also to know that we were sanctified by God um, set apart for his use set apart from the world to be different um, we're set apart unto God and we're set apart from the world if you want to look at it that way and then the third thing he wanted us to know in this book is that we were preserved in Jesus Christ that that's what we could can enjoy as a child of God knowing that we're called that we're sanctified and that we're preserved and kept by the protection of the Lord where he's our guardian he's our protector so when you know those things when you know you're called when you know you're set apart for God's service when you know you're preserved by God protecting you and keeping you that makes you a fearless Christian doesn't it, it makes you someone who is unafraid to face the things that you're gonna have to face and that's what Jude wanted us to know in this book this short book that is a power packed book let me tell you it is a very short short chapter um, one book of the Bible but it is one you don't need to skip just because you think it's short don't skip it because there's so much here to to learn and so so much that we may have to divide it up a little bit but we're going to start at verse one here's his identification Jude the servant of Jesus Christ the brother of James to them that are sanctified by God there it is the father we are preserved in Jesus Christ and we are called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied so right off the bat he greets us 
as the Christian reader telling us his identity and telling us our identity in Christ today. You are called. You are sanctified. You are chosen for his service to be set apart. And you are preserved by the power and protection of the Lord today. Hallelujah. That ought to make you excited right there. And he tells us that mercy and peace and love is extended to us from him as our Christian brother, that it be multiplied. And you know, this is what a heart sold out to God does. You have mercy, you have peace, you have love, and you're willing to give that to others. He says, Beloved, when I have all the diligence to write with you of the common salvation, meaning common to all mankind, Jesus offered his life for all mankind, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you, Meaning, he didn't necessarily want him to say these things that he was going to say, but I have to. He says, it's needful that I do this. That I exhort you that you should honestly, that word is powerful, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So what's he telling us? He's telling us we need to defend the faith. That we need, he was compelled to write this letter because there's some dangerous practices and doctrines that were being put out that were going against the very gospel of who Jesus is. And this was a dangerous thing. There was some serious issues, and he couldn't ignore it because the Holy Spirit had dealt with him to warn the people of these things. You know, we need to be warning people that Jesus is coming. And because he's coming, we need our house in order. We need to be ready to do all the things that God has called us to do in this hour, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love our families, to tell them, you know, I love you so much. I don't want you to be lost. I want you to be able to come in. I want you to enjoy um, the, the treasure that we have and knowing that the Lord is our Lord, our Savior. We have that common salvation, he's saying. A salvation for all of us. Uh, many believers sharing one thing in common that we have. We're many, yet we're one in Christ. So this is exciting to know. We're not alone. There is a world full of Christian believers who are fighting the good fight. That have not given up. Who have not quit. Who have not given their children over to the enemy. Who, who refuse to stop. But keep fighting for, for the things that we know are are the things of God and the things that we need to do. So he's telling us to contend. This is actually a wrestling term that means to antagonize over it, um, to have hard and diligent work, earnest for the faith. So how are we earnest for the faith? First of all, to be earnest for the faith, we've got to be a true faithful witness of Christ in our heart and in our life, the things we're saying, the things we're doing. And then we've got to support good pastors, good shepherds who are teaching the whole word of God. If you've got a good shepherd that is teaching you everything in the Bible, he's not just covering just the good stuff, you know, just the stuff that makes us happy, but he's stepping on your toes a little bit little bit. He's challenging you to come closer in your walk with God, to get rid of those things that are holding you back. You better praise God for a man or a woman like that, because that is what we do when we contend for the faith earnestly. And we're going to live uncompromising lives, aren't we? We're going to give credit to God for, for what we have, and we're going to give credit to God knowing that he's going to take care of us. We're going to have that ex essential truth of the gospel. And that's what James, or what Jude is telling us here, to have that faith that is good for all. Um, why should we contend? He's going to tell us why. Because there's dangerous men that are creeping in. So let's find out about these men at verse 4. He says, there are certain men, doesn't say who, certain men, who have crept in, snuck in. That's the way the devil works. He sneaks in, unaware, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness or lewdness, deliberate sin, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's telling us here, these men, they're dangerous because they crept in, they're false, they've been unnoticed by man, but they've not been unnoticed by God. God has seen them, and so much so that he has laid this in Jude's heart. And I'm going to tell you, these men still exist today. Men practicing sin without shame, women practicing sin without shame too. No conscience, immoral. Um, taking the truth of God's word and they've twisted it and turned it to suit their own needs. They've taken the message of grace and abused it. Um, denying the Lord. And there were three examples he's given us to show us here that there is going to be a certain judgment from God for these certain, when he says certain men. Um, and he's going to show us that right now. He says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. He's saying, you know these stories. You've heard them before, but I'm going to remind you again because you need to be reminded. So he's saying, remember, therefore you once knew how the Lord have saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroying them that believed not. 
So the angel which kept out from the first estate, but left their own habitation, and he reserved it in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. So he's given us two examples here. One, he's given us the example of the children of Israel, you know, going into the promised land, and they didn't get to go to the promised land. Why? Because of their unbelief. So the adults wandered around for 40 years till they died out, and the next generation got to go in because they had the faith to believe God, didn't they? They had the faith to believe that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. And so they got to take it by faith, but the others had to die in the wilderness, and they didn't get to have that promise of God because of their lack of faith. They refused to trust God. Um, they didn't enter in, um, and they didn't endure to the end, did they? Because they didn't believe God's power, and they didn't believe God's protection. And so they started out well, but they didn't get to finish. You know, it doesn't matter how well you start, if you don't endure and finish to the end, if you don't keep following Jesus to the end, it doesn't matter what you did at the beginning. What matters is how we finish. We've got to finish well. And this is the time, Christians, to finish well. Don't give up. Keep going. Um, and then he tells us about these angels at verse 6. Some angels that were imprisoned um, until judgment. And they're still there and in prison. It says they had a sinful pursuit of freedom. And it put them in bondage. Um, and that's, you know, that's what Satan does. He will make you think that you have an all, I want all these freedoms. I want to do what I want to do. I want to have my lifestyle, my way. But in reality, having your way puts you in chains um, of, of eternal chains that bind you instead of releasing you to have the freedom that you thought you had. So he refers to this and, and calls, compares it to Sodom and Gomorrah. Every time Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned, this is God's judgment. We see two cities being judged here. These cities in like manner, he said, giving themselves over to fornication. We know the homosexuality went on here. We know there was many other sins besides just that, but that was a big one. They were going after strange flesh, he said. They were set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So not only did they experience the fire being burned up in that moment when Simon and Gomorrah was destroyed, but they're experiencing it still to this day in eternal damnation for what happened in those two cities. You do not want to end up that way. That's what Jude is warning the people of. Don't. Don't get caught up in the flesh. Don't get caught up in sexual immorality. Don't get caught up in the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Because just as these people thought, this looks so great. You know, that was one of the reasons why Lot chose to dwell on the side that was Sodom and Gomorrah. It was well watered. It was green. It looked enticing. It looked like a land that was blessed. But in reality, it was kind of like, you know, land over a septic tank. It's green, but there's, there's nasty stuff underneath. It looks alive. It looks like it's something you want. But in reality, it has death underneath it. And that's exactly what was happening here. So Jude's saying, be aware of this. Be aware of the character of dangerous places and the dangerous things that are happening. Verse 8, he says, likewise, also these filthy dreamers, he calls them, defile the flesh. They despise dominion. They despise authority. And they speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he was fighting with the devil, disputed over, about the body of Moses, does not bring against him in a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. How did, what is Jude telling us this for? He's telling us that the archangel Michael fought, Michael fought with the devil himself. And when he was fighting with him, he didn't fight under his authority because he didn't have any. He fought under the Lord's authority. So this is telling us when we're in battle with the devil, we got to fight under the authority of God. When we do that, we're going to win. So he said, you know, we just said the Lord rebuke you. He couldn't say, my, I, my, I, Michael, rebuke you. It wouldn't work. He had to, to, to battle under the authority of God. When Jesus fought with the devil, he said, I rebuke you. Because he was the power. He was the authority. That power was in us today, Christians. We have the power to rebuke the devil and to tell him to leave. In the name of Jesus, we have that same power. Praise God for that today. So, you know, these characters, these men, they were immoral. They were rejecting God's authority. The established authority of God. They didn't want to follow God's rules. They wanted to follow their rules. Don't we see that in our society today? Man-made religion. Man-made rules. I'm going to follow this, but I'm not going to follow this. That's not going to cut it. God is telling us through this word, and this is tough, but he's telling us you've got to follow and do it my way. You can't do it the way you want to do it. You've got to follow my way. When you do it my way, you're going to have more freedom than you've ever imagined. But when you follow the devil's way, you're going to be in bondage. Everlasting chains is what he's telling us here. So when we battle, when we fight the devil, we got to fight him under the authority of the Lord. 
We got to battle in his authority. We must battle him as, as hard as we can in the name of the Lord. We can't do it in our physical strength, but we can do it in God's strength. So these men, at verse 10, speaking evil of those things which they know not. So speaking things that they don't know. Do you know people who tell lies about stuff they haven't, they haven't even talked to the person, but they're just making it up? Well, that's what he's talking about here. Um, they know naturally the brute beast, he called them, and those things that corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the arrow Balaam for reward and perished in the gang saying of Kor. Now, what are they talking about here? What's Jude talking about? He's talking about three people here. Gone the way of Cain. What's that mean? We've gone from unbelief to faith or faith to unbelief. Which one is it? Cain is the unbelief, isn't he? Abel was the one that gave the offering that was the sacrificial offering, the offering made by faith. It wasn't that necessarily that his offering was was better, that the lamb was better over the grain. It was the heart condition that was the problem. It was how they offered what they offered. Abel offered it with a faith-filled heart. Cain offered it with an unbelieving heart. He didn't offer it in a way that was pleasing to God. So that's why his sacrifice was rejected. A sacrifice offered without faith is unacceptable to God. That's what he's telling us here. So if we have unbelief, empty religion, if we're jealous of other people, if we're persecuting those who, go who are godly, if you're persecuting your shepherd of your church or someone that's in leadership, that's the spirit of Cain. And it's a murderous anger. It's somebody that wants to destroy you. They don't want to just say one thing. They want to literally try to destroy you because you are a representative of God. Been there, done that. Um, and, and we see it happening all over in churches all around this world, sadly. And we see it happening in the world that if you're a Christian, that the people who aren't Christians are attacking you because of what you believe, because of what your stand is, because you won't go along with what everybody else is doing. So this is, this is the way of Cain. He tries to murder you, destroy you, because of your faith-filled offering. And we sure don't want to be those kind of people. We want to be a faith-filled person. The heir of Balaam, leading people into sin. That's what Balaam did. He did it for money. He continued to tell. Even God kept warning him, even through a donkey speaking to him, don't go any farther. But he continued on and continued to go. But every time he went, he couldn't curse the people of God. He, just, he blessed them. He had to speak blessings. But at the same time, he told them what to do to destroy the people by idolatry and getting in there um, by being greedy. So that's the spirit or the error of Balaam. We don't want to be greedy. We don't want to lead people into sin and lead them in the wrong direction. That, and then Korah is just that resenting authority. Do you know people who don't take authority well? People who don't like to, to take correction from people in authority over them? They won't listen? Um, well, this, this is a lesson that should scare us right here when we see this story because Korah went against Moses, we know, and he went against Aaron. He went against their authority. And what did God do? God swallowed him up into the ground. That's what he did. You know, that should get your attention. You don't go against God's anointed. You don't go against those that are above you in the Lord and try to rebel and exert your authority over people who are, are over you in the Lord. we got to be careful about that. Um, this is this story should shake you up. Um, not only that, but the people that supported Korah in this rebellion, they were destroyed by fire. So their rebellion, their rejection of God's appointed leaders, God wasn't pleased with it. And God's not pleased with us when we don't back our leaders that are doing right, that we support their authority, that we accept their authority, we accept correction when they're telling us right. Um, and, and so these are some tough, I'm telling you, some tough lessons here to learn. But we're going to stop right there. We're going to start with the rest of it tomorrow. But I just encourage you, read this book. It will challenge you. It's a short book, but a powerful book. It's, it's really power packed so we love you we're praying for you we hope this word challenged you today please like share subscribe it we would love you to share this with three four ten people today if you can um, and just let this word get out that God loves you he is in complete control he is our protection he has set you apart for his service today he's called you he's sanctified you and he's preserving you he is keeping you today so be confident in that today we love you god bless we'll see you soon